Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live poetry reading. Uh, tonight we got a fine group of poets Charles Cloud, Silic Ball, June Bloomington, Christine Ellsworth, and Mark Renner. As usual, I'm going to start by reading a couple of my poems. The first one is called Remember. There is poetry coming from the graveyard and the beach. It whistles so slowly to those with ears and eyes open, like a warm breath amidst a cold wind. It is the spiral of the hawk above you. Um, happy Father's Day to everyone who's a father. Um, I do have a poem about my dad. I'll read that. Self-esteem. My dad often spoke about the importance of a positive attitude, good self-esteem. He then lectured, yelled, and beat any self-esteem out of me. In spite of this, he really wasn't a bad guy. After all, he taught us to shoot baskets, throw a ball, fish. He took us camping, whatever we wanted to or not. During his rants, he would accuse everyone of being against him. He would scream, a house divided cannot stand. My brothers and sister wondered if someone he trusted screwed him over, perhaps in the Air Force, World War II. The ranting was beyond his control. He died of heart failure, literally. I recall nights he would take his pipe out of his mouth, pick up an old collection of poetry and read to us, oh captain, my captain, quoth the raven nevermore, and by the shores of Gitche I started writing poetry in high school, attended the Young Poets Workshop in Michigan at 18, was published in my community college literary arts magazine. On my poetry, he never said a word. And now I'd like to introduce the first reader. Charles Kozilek Ball has been writing poetry since he was 17 years of age. He majored in English at Osborne University where his love of poetry really flourished. He has several poems published in the Southwest Journal, a community newspaper in Minneapolis. He also had poetry published in the Talking Stick. When not writing poetry, Charles makes his living doing and teaching Reiki healing, parrot reading, and spiritual direction. Take it away, Charles. Thank you, Ron. Good evening, everyone, and happy Father's Day and happy summer solstice. I have a couple of poems that really reflect around the time of the solstice. So I'm going to start with those. My first one is called Midsummer's Night, which was last night. Witch's night, bright moonlight, bask in the glow, wander roads and woods, speaking spirits, seeking spirits flow. Mask the musk of discontent and open up your eyes. See the magic happening now and fill with joyful surprise. Dance in a circle three times round, grab a broom and leap off the ground. Tie a ribbon to the candle before you light the flame. On a paper, cut to square, write your wish by name. Burn the paper in the fire, concentrate on your deep desire. In the chalice, pour the wine, any vintage, make sure it's fine. Trust the Lord and Lady too. They will make your wish come true. My second one, also sort of a summer solstice type of poem is called Apollo Rising. On his porch with candles, with candles lit, with incense burning, the seer did sit, invoking the lady of the moon to send him a blessed boon. As the day turned to dusk, he whiffed the incense scent of musk. O oh, lady, lady, I implore, do not think me a simple bore. Send me a sign of pure delight on this warm midsummer night. Send a clear sign from you, so I know you are with me true. Your seer I will always be, if only you'll send a sign to me. A sound of running down the street, the seer did sense the slap of jogging feet. The slap, slap, slap came ever near, 
and the jogging man did appear. Wearing only shorts and footwear, the runners seemed unaware of the seer's intense gaze, burning through the twilight haze. The runner slowed and came to a stop. He twisted his back and made a pop. The seer could not believe his sight. Was this Apollo incarnate tonight? The runner walked on down the block. The seer watched, still in shock. As the runner did disappear, the seer felt the blessing clear. The seer clasped his hands so devout, and then he blew his candles out. The next one is called The Summer of Dying and Living. This, like so many other summers, is a summer of dying and living. In the beauty of spring, I got great news. A scary lesion, one that frightened me into action, was gone. Gone. Yeah, gone from the energy of Reiki and prayer, sucked up and transformed by the divine. A new lease on life, the right to continue breathing, dreaming, and living. As dreaming and living continues on, death encroaches, its bony fingers sending chills to those around me. As I continue breathing, others around me stop. The next door neighbor, a relative, there always seems to be someone I know who is dying. Ever since I was 24, the years blur under death's steely presence. I've wondered if this is a twist of karma, some weird fate. Yet I breathe and continue dreaming and living. Walking in a nature reserve, all prairie and wildflowers, a beautiful summer day of living. One day, these yellow black-eyed Susans and purple cones will meet the end of will meet their end of frost, but not today. We all feel the kiss of the sweet summer breeze as we continue breathing and living. Spring cleaning. So we can back up a, a little bit in the season. It's time to clean my house to unclutter each room and let go. It is overwhelming to release the tension of yesterday's dreams, but I'm older now and I've changed. For my own sake, it is good to let go. It is time to clean out what I inherited from my parents, keeping what is truly useful and ridding myself of the rest. I can clear out the items from friends and relatives that reflect their dreams. I can get rid of old spiritual stuff that no longer works. Once the clutter is gone, it is good to sweep out all the cobwebs and tangles in each corner. Forgiveness begins at home, and it's good to clean house. And I'll end with Morticia. When I was a little boy, I dreamed of becoming Morticia Adams. I wanted to live in a huge old house filled with wickedly strange and fascinating things and have a Frankensteinian-like butler that would serve me smoldering tea in china cups. I wanted to do seances and sit in a cool wicker chair and smoke with my whole body. I wanted Gomez to kiss up my arms whenever I spoke French because I was so irresistible. I wanted a real lion for my kitty, so it would frighten off all the overly mundane and conservative neighbors as if my antics wouldn't be enough. I wanted to play at sword fights, dance the tango, and go moonbathing. Yes, when I was a little boy, I dreamed of becoming Morticia Adams so I could be wildly magical and free. I look at my life and think, wow, Maybe I did become her. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Charles. Good job as usual. I like the uh, summer of dying and living, especially. I always like the Morticia Adams poem. Uh, before I forget, folks, uh, in case you were wondering, all the poets reading tonight have book, a book or books on Amazon. 
So something to check out. Uh, next, we have June Blumenson. After a long career providing direct service, training and development of mental health services in Washington, D.C., Toronto, and Minneapolis, June Blumenson focused on her love of poetry. She is widely published in literary journals, including Constat, French Literary Review, San Pedro River Review, Literal Latte, and Martin Lake Journal. She was a finalist for Nimrod's Pablo Neruda Prize for Poetry and is the recipient of a lot of the Lofts Literary Center's Sacred Shorts Award for her poem, Dogs of War, that was installed at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Her collection of poetry, A Scythe of Moon, was published by Cal State Books in 2020. She lives in Minneapolis and creates a poetry reading series, facilitates writing groups, and is a member of the Poetry Therapy Network. Take it away, June. Thank you, Ron. Uh, it's a joy to be here and to meet the other poets this evening. Um, I'm going to start out with a, a poem that was inspired by a short story entitled ASDF that I recently read in the New Yorker. It was written by <clears throat> Saeed Seira Fizadeh. And I, I, I took a um, epitaph from, from the short story. Uh, the poem is entitled, Bless Your Sweet Eyes. And the epitaph reads, the difference between seeing and looking is the difference between understanding oneself and continuing to live in ignorance. Bless your sweet eyes. It's the kind of intimacy, the way he stares into my eyes as if he can read my thoughts deep beyond the retina, alone with him in a dim light room. I strain to read the chart. He measures the sharpness of my vision, searches for a lazy eye. There's a sense of apprehension when he puffs small bursts of air into my eyes, flashes lights to determine blind spots, covers one eye at a time to detect misalignment, fixation. Head held still, my eyes follow left to right, right to left, the hand the slow movement of his handheld light that reveals how quick I am to jump from one thing to another. He flips lenses through varying degrees of magnitude, checks for color, blindness, assesses depth, perception. In the end, deficiencies are redeemable. We can fine tune the lens power. It's only a matter of how we choose to see the world in the quickening light. My next poem uh, is from my book, uh, Scythe of Moon. And uh, June is National Awareness Month of Nature and gardens, roses, and all of that. So this is a garden poem <clears throat> entitled Cabbages and Kings. I wonder what Monet obsessed with changing light would see if he wandered into my garden to sit with me on plein air. Would we sip wine, talk of shadows captured like caged fireflies gone dim? Would he illuminate my single view rendered helpless to each stroke of time, each brush of dark and dappled light? Would I ask him, where have all the people gone? in his painted streets and beaches. And when did this garden, place of cabbages, place of kings, pull us to the must of earth, the turn of worms? When did this solitary place become enough? This is a pandemic poem. And, uh, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, when I wrote this, uh, you know, I was still in the mode of, oh, isn't it wonderful to have all this time to do all this reading? And uh, well, we know where that went after a while. So this was from the early days of the pandemic. In search of lost time. There's a certain rhythm to my days. Maybe an underlining rhyme or two. Yes, definitely a fundamental, fragile hum. As I monitor my whereabouts, regiment my daily tasks. 
I hardly ever know what day it is. I have taken to color coding my clothing, blue Monday, white on Friday, to ensure, as in some cultures, happiness will permeate the day. Quarantined to reflection, I read a graphic adaptation of Proust. Can't quite grasp his privilege, but ah, the beautiful drawings, the poetic text floating in bubbles above young Marcel's head. I fancy a stroll by the lilies in Vivon, a walk in gardens of Combray, empathize with his aunt Leon, sequestered in her room with only the street to distract her, musing about people who pass by. I ponder La Madeleine and yearn for a bite of my mother's sweet dough biscuits baked in rich cream. Recall pastoral summer days on my cousin's farm when she dared me to lick the horse's salt block. The lost game of childhood when we pressed our sweaty palms on a tabletop and to our astonishment, it began to rise. In my garden, wafts of honeysuckle surround me, bird song, a little phrase, a caress. And the last two poems I'm gonna read, um, today's my birthday. So I'm gonna read um, uh, a poem honoring my parents. Uh, the first one's gonna honor my ancestors. And okay, it's called Interwoven, Ancestry.com. Instead of crouching by a campfire, picking fleas from buffalo hides draped around shoulders, I imagine them weaving. What shall I create? A Neanderthal must have thought as she braided fibers. Her high old bone allows her to speak. Her brain is huge, her speech broken. She strikes flint against yellow pyrite, loves the metallic luster, adds peels of birch bark to stoke the fire. When she tries to explain her okra painting in the cave of La Pasiega, sound escapes her chinless mouth louder than planned. But this isn't the time for Soto Voce. There is so much she needs to shout before they vanish. Perhaps she says homo sapiens were enticed by scents of roasting birds or wondered why a convocation of golden eagles circled above Gibraltar. Perhaps they followed our singing to where we gathered when they paddled the narrow strait from East Africa to the Iberian shore. And maybe those who crossed the Pyrenees found the cave stencil of my hand along the way. My people taught the strangers to hunt eagles in string necklaces with talons. And although we were the other, they ate our food, quelled our loneliness, and we interbred. My last poem is called Birth Record. Unlike Athena, sprouted, fully grown from her father's head, born brave, ready to take on challenges at birth, I was conceived in the usual way of two humans, a crybaby. The last of six siblings, not my parents' midsummer's night dream, they named me June. I would have named myself Solstice or Horizon, born on the cusp of Gemini and Cancer, but it was not the dawning of flowers and light. The whole world was festering. Armored tanks roiled across nations. Battle cries rang in the night. Unlike Athena, I don't leave tapestries depicting gods punishing mortals. I'm not a virgin. I've never carried a spear or lived on top of a mountain. And yet, like Athena, I was born in an extraordinary way, nurtured in a mortal mother's womb, dropped into the birth canal, crowned at the vaginal opening, pushed head first into the unknown, wailing. Thank you. Thank you, Joan.
and thanks for joining us on your special day. Yes, thank you. I've uh, never heard Bert described so poetically before. <laughs> um, our next poet is Christine Madeline Ellsworth. She holds a BA and MA degrees in English literature from Moorhead State University, Moorhead and Marquette University, respectfully. She is a member of the Jack Pine Writers Block, and her poetry has appeared in issues of The Talking Stick. Her work also appeared in Moorhead State University's Wed Red Weather and the South Dakota State Poetry Society's Past Petals. She is currently working toward certification as a certified applied poetry therapy facilitator through the International Federation of Biblical, Biblical Poetry Therapy. Ellsworth was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and is currently lives in Windmere, North Dakota. Girl Again is her first book of poetry. Take it away, Christine. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, um, Ron. Um, so I'm just going to jump in and start reading the first one uh, here. Uh, it's appeared in the uh, last fall's talking stick. It's called Kitchen Table. Close cousins drag the family farm table in two chairs from the perspiring inside out onto the soft July lawn nearing moonrise for a post picnic talk under the stars near a lake in Becker County, Minnesota. One hand carved oak leg of the table sinks under an elbow, pops up with the weight of the others and their spilled Chardonnay makes of laughter a leavening. Within moments, the glass pitcher topped with their icy wine sweats a faint water sheen and sets new dark circles hastily hand stopped, hand sopped, but soon enough set in the soft old wood already scarred with Uncle Siggy's initials the night his sister Linnea arrived in 22. The soft depression where the weekly bread was needed for decades and the corduroy gouges set by the Alice, Alice Chalmers Model B engine Grandpa Joseph rebuilt during the harrowing winter of 1947. This evening, their soft reverent voices recount the familiar old stories of beloved godmother Astrid or the stern hired hand Paul, or the babies that died of diphtheria and the still that brewed hooch in the 30s when no grain would grow. Now the year's news, the mass shootings, hurricanes, starving polar bears, scares them equally and with their heads close in the dark, the two talk over the faint ghostly rings and unclaimed tattoos on the ancient table while overhead acorns dance on the northern red oaks growing slowly toward the farmhouse rooftop. Um, this one's a, a little bit longer. Um, this is a story about transition from victim to survivor. Um, this was originally published uh, in uh, Minnesota State University's Red Weather. Rembrandt's Light. A number four pencil drew his dark things, hand rubbed shadows in the hollow parts of breastbone, lip, and temple, blackened, blurry question marks that pocked the bedroom walls and rows of daggery dots sketched hastily across inverted exclamation points so heavily graphited that they dully pewter eyes. It was a fine tool for slashing too, serrated the rumpled black eyed page, my jagged rip tear and shred, distorted axis lines detailed a crosshatched hard edge, punctured and drained the living tint of human skin. But it was finally snapped into the back of an institutionally pink room where he took drawing lessons in a thin gown, was the used up eraser and splintered piece with the countersunk to bare wood molar marks that he put there himself. They calmly presented clean rag stock and a sharpened number two. Expected illuminations promised me pastels. Came years then of the slow divergence from that old master, sometime hiding in hotels and lights out rental cars on back streets, disappearing in broad daylight in between the stark lines of realism. Later came the courtrooms lined with young lawyers brandishing their letters of metallic legalese in the days of carbon copy records. That slurry of pigments winding through offices in an escherized procession, one hand shaking another, 
yet attached at a common source. There was no true perspective in those pen and ink times. Later still, I took up with the postmodernity of green polymers and wet acrylics, impressionistic streaks of cerise, some inspirations of celadon and ever bolder hued advanced into blocks of Mondrian order, despite more pencils, pens, and brushes with abstraction. When Rembrandt's light dawned plain and simple in my 57th year, like a shade lifted from the window of my dim study, this muddy sensuous slip of earth finally settled in a true proportion as under the steady hot heat of a wood-fired kiln. I came to know this new element slowly, quietly and greenly, like a tree budding in the earth on a hard spring through a season of soft, holy rains and waving grasses, through a shimmer of autumn leaves aloft in its illuminating radiance. Then, these many years later, it transformed those shadows, silhouettes and surfaces into this clear-eyed movement of easy coursing blood and balanced feet, wholly freeform, shine-faced, a girl again with a broom. Here's one about one of my best friends in the entire world. Victoria heals herself. Her wide white hips, so remarkable, made black men in the streets of Chicago turn and stare, take note in hushed O's and raised eyebrows when she passed. She knew they did. She always says with that dazzling smile, certain men like big hips. And it does take a discerning gent to see the strength in her swagger, to see how those hips have carried her home day after day for more than 60 years, through her childhood in Milwaukee, through a marriage, through grad school in Indiana, to Norway and back to the ritzier suburbs of Chicago, she'd be strong. So when the cancer showed up a second time, the surgeons harvested some subcutaneous treasure from those amazing white hips and fashioned a new breast for a matching pair. Victoria healed herself with herself. Certain men still flirt with their beautiful brown eyes. She still got her swagger. She still be strong. She likes to say with her hands on those wide white hips, these babies have saved my ass more than once. I'd like to read one that um, it, it's not been published yet, but I'm gonna run it by you and see what y'all think. It's called, um, What to Wear While Saving France. What to wear while saving France. Don't worry, it's been saved already by a woman who looked much like we do today. And what with our cropped hair and our men's wear, we would have burned at the stake too. Since most of us do hear divine voices, such as what guides us to plant tomatoes today and not wait till tomorrow, or when to open the door to a stray cat. It's the same wisdom that taught us as primeval women to draw new life from inside ourselves and bravely sever that cord, setting all of us free. Some call it witchcraft or strange lunar influences and it wasn't just the old kings in those middle-aged Burgundians who were moved to strike flint by such unparalleled power. These days, you'll not be killed for wearing trousers or offering good counsel to, say, the mayor, but you'll still need to advance hard against the prejudicial ranks and rally an army to reason when the need arises, as it will, as it does daily, to thwart that ancient fear. Wear your body to such events as though you yourself own it. Um, then I think I will finish here with uh, from a defeated physician. She is crouched. She is a violated fold of legs and arms. She is downed. She is numb. She is collapsed. She is breathless, but takes in an upwelled breath. She blinks. She unlocks a fist. 
She rolls her weight back upon her heels, braces one thigh muscle, then the other, and hauls the whole of herself up onto her feet, and so stands. She slowly unlocks the other fist and brings both palms together, then flings wrists wide, and opening her mouth, sings a victory of soft stars into the night sky. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Very nice. I like the Joan of Arc poem. Uh, next up, we have Mark Linear. Mark Quinier has published poetry in print and online literary magazines across the U.S. and overseas. His poems have been published in the Kansas Quarterly, the Literary Review, the Spoon River Quarterly, the Pacific Review, Paragy, Cordite, Writers Resist, Crosswinds Poetry Journal, Iris's, the University of Canberra Vice Chancellor's International Poetry Prize Annual, and elsewhere. A chapbook, Approaching Poetry, was published in 2017 by Finishing Line Press. He is currently work, writing and living on the edge of the Cleveland here, Mark Reed. Um, I first, I uh, guess I would like to read, uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, uh, being here and I'm enjoying your poetry. Uh, first poem I'd like to read is uh, a poem about my childhood. It uh, recalls my father was in the Air Force, and uh, we were stationed in Tripoli, Libya. And on the way back from there, we took a trip around the Mediterranean to see all the tourist sites. And this poem is about that part of that experience. It's called Remembering My First Look at Michelangelo's Pietà. I remember that first shiver of recognition. He's dead, I said to my mother, as we stopped in that hall in St. Peter's. I was 10 years old at the time, visiting Italy with my family, traveling home from four years with my father and the US Air Force in Libya. The artist's muscular Moses with its bulging veins and patriarchal stare was still in my brain when I stepped into the light of Christ's death. He was lying there on Mary's lap, as limp and full of lost humanity as marble can be. The memory is indelible, not erased by the brutality of wars or the attack that damaged it in 1972. I mourn that desecration today, just as at 10, I caressed the toe of Christ's left foot. It was worn and stained by the touch of thousands of previous worshipers. Thank you. The next poem is a, uh, a poem I wrote after spending weeks watching this egret in the Santa Ana River on my way to work in Fullerton. It's called Stalking Egret. Still as a statue carved from the best Carrera marble, white on black bone stilts in the water running off toward the blue Pacific, with his neck stretched out above the shadows where, his, where he stands in the Santa Ana River, or every now and then takes a slow step toward where another fish may lie, indifferent to the sun shining down or to the heady stare of those eyes above him looking down, watching for that first sign of life, a fin's flicker, a minnow that he can stab and stop against the sandy flat, above the flying shadows of ripples moving on toward meaning, toward that hint of transcendence left when wavelets die unnoticed on the shore he stalks. The next poem is uh, about a friend of mine, uh, the fishing buddy. He, we grew up together in high school, went to high school together, spent many happy hours fishing. And he died too young, not too long ago. It's called A Fishing Poem for Ron. Salt spray and deep sea mist tonight break rainbows out of light. But the upturned wakes of boats that start together into night and then run far apart, following fishermen out to different grounds to catch different, far different fish, give proof that friendships formed in youth, although they persevere as time together shapes them soon enough can fade as work and separation toll, 
families detain and different interests steer us toward separate paths, the separate paths we make in the ocean's dark contain. If fishing was like life, then what we caught together would strengthen bonds tonight, despite the loss of touch that time and entropy impose upon our lives apart. And I'd have known that ends were near in your boat over there, across the waves between, where rainbows failed you in your pain, and I was lost and distant here, unaware, unseen. My next poem is uh, about my son and his wife's wedding day. They were married at the, feet, at the foot of the San Bernardino Mountains in a big ranch with a, underneath a big, huge old white uh, live oak tree. Uh, they told us this was the oldest live oak tree on earth. It's called Under the Thousand Year Oak. Not immortal or divine, not lost in Eden with its snake. Not new world histories driven west by old world crimes, but in their love embodied here by gray dove wings, the spirit spread over twisted branches two feet thick. Some shattered by wind or lightning strikes, some blackened by firestorms endured through years of drought restraining growth, disease, disease born galls healed over now by bark grown thick and furrowed under years of hard times shared with earth enduring soils enriched by green, by time together growing free, without promise, promise now, with strength entrusted in each other, grown through love beyond all doubts, made strong by laughter shared together, hunger fed by care and feasts, worlds of knowledge and trust maintained by traveling wherever, wherever interest led across the country, overseas, wherever time and need allowed, come at last to hallowed ground, where roots grown deep and branches spread. Above this wedding couple live the spirit of strength and permanence, prosperity and family, wings of peace to Paul and Rachel sharing vows before their families and friends, tying with rings and a hand fast knot, their loves, lives together in love beneath this oldest live oak tree on earth. Uh, the next poem is called Hermit Thrush. It's coming out or it has come out. I'm not sure whether it's been published yet in the Martin Lake Journal. Hermit Thrush, pompous little poet bird chirping in the underbrush or hopping through the trees. He hunts bugs and berries to feed his birdie needs. Providing daily, daily nourishment, bugs scratched off the ground, keep him chirping full of song. As all alone, he searches for perfect little living things, food for thought I've found. As are the berries growing, or bro growing where bro broken sunlight shines through windblown leaves above. They mark the end of summer's bounty, these ripened berries withering on the edges of this woodland where bird songs speak of other needs. As quietly I sit and scratch these little dramas playing through short seasons full of poems, words move swiftly toward the end of bopping through the underbrush where flitting feathered miracles toss autumn songs around. Thank you. Um, this next poem is a uh, poem about the California fire season last year. It's called Fire Moon Rising. Uh, it was front paged in the Open Arts Forum just, just not too long ago. Fire Moon Rising, California 2020. North, south, and central. Wildfires under a quarter moon threaten the entire state. The fire moon looks down on them as they rise into dusk. Red as it rises into dusk. The devil, I think, grins there tonight as I walk along the street. Avoiding late summer heat and smoke, the evil orange of daytime skies. Still the drift of fine gray ash from fires burning miles away, floats over hillsides and peaks, up canyons under rocky cliffs, across the flatland glass and grasses, blowing toward and away from homes and streets, wherever winds direct. Incandescent energy rises out of drought and heat, the fire moon moves over, looms over it all, shedding its ruddy light. 
is there for all to see when they look up, awaiting the new dawn's break. And the last poem I'd like to read is in my uh, book, uh, my chat book, Approaching Poetry. It's called Varieties of Snow. These words are snow and wind as are the white petals fallen, adrift from trees in spring, awakenings for all to see of summer's green leaves, the flutterings of white winged butterflies against the edge of shadows under which I walk. As I look up and see in the fall sun's glare, white as light made soft, a sift of down floating down of cottonwood seeds aloft. And these are also snow as dropped like flakes of ice on singing winds, the waking up of dour winter calls, the crystal snow of time home to all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Very enjoyable poem. Thanks. Um, well, that's it for the reading. I'd like to finish with a poem by Shelley, but before I do that, I want to thank all the readers tonight and all the viewers, and a special thanks to the Minneapolis Television Network and Valerie Lockhart for putting this thing on. And here is Ozymandias. I met a traveler from my antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage flies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculpture well these passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my work, ye mighty in despair. Nothing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Thank you, everybody. Have a happy Father's Day, all you fathers. Um, next time we do a live poetry reading, it'll probably be September, so have a nice rest of the summer. Hopefully everybody who gets who needs rain gets rain. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Ron, everybody else. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.